that, let's go ahead and get started. So really quickly, we're gonna we're gonna do the little sales pitch and then we're gonna jump into to battery chemistry. So where were we started? We started as OES Energy um, back in 2010. And really that was kind of um, ancient history in the realm of energy storage at the time, right? The uh, grid tied, um, at least in California, so photovoltaics didn't really start taking off until the 90s and uh, the mid 2000s. Uh, you know, Tesla Powerwalls and the other kind of energy storage systems really weren't even coming out. So 2010, we came to the market with uh, lithium iron phosphate battery packs, primarily used in the uh, film and broadcast industry. We quickly realized uh, that this safer chemistry that uh, we have developed would be great for other uses, including the military. Uh, so we partnered up with the military. Uh, they took some of our batteries out to the Aberdeen Proving Ground, uh, which is an army base on the East Coast, and subjected our batteries to these like rigorous uh, high temperature, high um, vibration environments that uh, really proved out our batteries and how safe they were. Really, if you think about it at that time, there was a lot of lithium ion batteries making the news for going into thermal runaway. And really what wasn't mentioned at that time was that it was a certain type of chemistry and maybe a certain type of for form factor that led to those failures. We wanted to, to prove to not only um, the wider industry, but also the military that we have a safer battery. And ultimately we did deploy in some of the forward operating bases where the army was using um, uh, diesel generators, which created heat signatures or lead acid batteries that weren't really living up to what they had expected. 2013, 2014, we began to expand our product line, kind of dabbling into the residential um, market. 2015, 2016, we really doubled down on our residential products. We uh, launched, uh, relaunched to Simplify Power. You can see our access unit, which is right above uh, the 2015, 2016 uh, picture there. I'll talk about that a little bit later. 2017, 2020 was really exciting because we were able to open up a research and development facility um, and start to uh, vet new products for the market, one of them being our high voltage line, which I'm also going to talk a little bit about. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of excitement around high voltage systems, especially with uh, the Solark 30K coming out, which is a 208 three phase inverter. But if you look carefully at that Solark 30K spec sheet, you realize that you need uh, battery voltage inputs of at least 150 volts. And we're going to talk about it here, why uh, we have low voltage lines and high voltage lines. So with that excitement around this new Solark and other high voltage inverters on the market, we're really uh, kind of excited to, to talk a little bit more about our high voltage line than you may have seen in some of my previous talks. 2021, really to the present, uh, we were purchased by Briggs & Stratton. I'm really excited about this partnership. Um, you're seeing the, the bringing together of a battery company, uh, energy storage um, company, energy solutions company, together with this old um, history of Briggs & Stratton. Briggs & Stratton has been around for 115 years. Uh, they have a lot of um, uh, uh, name brand recognition. So as we're you know, talking to our homeowners and we're sitting down at the kitchen table, uh, what names that they recognize uh, builds trust. And really that Briggs & Stratton logo that you see there is, is a household name and household products. You know, if you're in the, the InterSolar, if you're at RE+, if you're at one of these big shows, we as solar professionals probably recognize a lot of the names in the industry, but your average homeowner doesn't. What they're going to recognize is that bar and shield. They're going to recognize Briggs and, & Briggs and Stratton and, and really understand this history of innovation and engineering. We truly have a global footprint. And what I'm also excited to talk about is that we have expertise in both energy storage and generators. For me, I came from kind of the off-grid background. I worked at a company called Sunfrost that made uh, refrigerators. And part of being off-grid always usually incorporated some type of generator to get you through the dead of winter, right? Why am I going to design a solar system for you uh, that's going to be way oversized in summer just to get you through winter. So keeping in mind how generators and energy storage can complement each other is something I'm looking forward to talking about in the future and, and even in this talk today. We make these batteries in 
California, in Oxnard, California, which is a town just north of Los Angeles. So I'm really excited to, to say that uh, we're able to maintain a lot of good quality control uh, and make rapid improvements to any of our products because we have in-country manufacturing. Same goes for our engines. I'm also really excited about my training. Uh, we're going to have some uh, Briggs & Stratton trailers. Uh, we're going to be traveling around the country doing a road show. So if that's something you're interested in, please email me. I'd be happy to pull a trailer up in front of your business, uh, invite homeowners, maybe invite other installers from your area, and we can talk about uh, the inverter, the generators, and um, get deeper into some of these technical questions. Really, we are committed to uh, uh, this future going forward. And again, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later, uh, the commercial side of things and how that commercial side, I, I think, is going to grow. Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna go kind of quickly through the sales stuff just because I know a lot of you here to hear about chemistry and and that's what I'm excited to talk about. Part of the chemistry is that it's safe, right? We use a lithium iron phosphate battery, not a cobalt base, so we're cobalt free. What that results in is a non toxic, non hazardous battery with no risk of thermal runaway with fire propagation. And really, there should be the word no unmitigated fire went away because you can still have thermal runaway in a lithium iron cell. It's just what happens after that thermal runaway event? Does it continue to self-propagate to adjacent cells, to adjacent batteries, to adjacent battery cabinets, or does it kind of just peter out and put itself out? And, and that's what our 9540A large-scale fire testing report showed. That 9540A test, it's not a pass-fail. It's a, it's a determination of what happens when your system goes into thermal runaway then dictates what's called out in our UL 9540 listing. Uh, UL 1642 is on the cell level and UL 1973 is on the um, uh, the battery module or battery is what I like to call it um, level. And we do have talks that we go dive much deeper into these uh, UL listings and talk about why they matter. Uh, maybe you're not even getting an inspection. Maybe uh, the inspector isn't going to even ask this. Maybe perhaps you're off grid. Why would you still want to look for products that have these UL listings insurance purposes? What happens if you have an event and the insurance adjuster is poking around? Uh, just for peace of mind, knowing that you have something that's been vetted and in, in, by a third party to show that it's safe. So if you're out there in the market uh, to either install or, or purchase um, energy storage not just ours, maybe anybody, always look for those UL listings. Look for the UL 9540A test report and see if that company is making that test report public. Uh, we make it public and I'll, I can show you where on our website that to find that. It allows you really to understand the safety of batteries. And as somebody who sold energy storage to homeowners, it's a conversation I like to have uh, with the homeowners and, and let them know that safety is important. UN Department of Transportation uh, 3480 allows us to ground ship these batteries, uh, LTL, less than, uh, less than truckload. Um, 38.3 DOT is for air shipping the batteries. And for those of you in California, SGIP, which is a self-generation incentive program, some state money, uh, we're uh, approved for that list. Again, backing up a little bit, we've been around a long time. In fact, we have batteries that are outliving their warranty, is that 10-year warranty. So uh, we're not just a pop-up that started. We're, we've been around, we've been proven. We were tested by the military, as I mentioned. And we do have a business model that can demonstrate social impact and profitability can coexist. A so-called triple bottom line, people, planet, and profits. Like I said, we're made, uh, we manufacture the batteries in Oxnard, California, and the generators are made uh, in the Milwaukee area and down in the South. Simple. One thing that we've always been known for is having a battery that is inverter agnostic. You can take one of our batteries and use it with what you like. Do you like a Solar? Do you like a Schneider? Do you like a Victron? Do you like a, a Morningstar, a Samlex? As long as you get into that inverter or charge controller and adjust the set points, like the low battery cutout, like the floats, like the, the bulk voltages, um, like the maximum discharge or charge currents, you can use our batteries. And we have, and I'll talk about them later, where to find them, integration guides that help you program those other pieces of equipment. 
We do have our own vertically integrated energy storage system now, which I'm going to talk about. But I don't want us to forget where our roots were in using these batteries uh, in a lot of different applications, on-grid, off-grid, um, lead-acid battery replacement as well. Again, the UL listings, I think, are really important. I was out at NAPCEP conference out in St. Louis. Uh, if anybody was at NAPCEP, go ahead and please put it into the uh, the Q&A, just let me know you were there. I thought it was a great conference, a lot of great talks. And one of my talks, the, my only talk was about uh, the UL 9540A large scale fire test report, which we have um, published on our uh, website. So always look for those, even if you your inspector isn't asking for this stuff yet. Uh, I think they're going to be, I hope they're going to be asking for that soon and not let you pull a permit unless that uh, 9540 and 9540A listings on there. But really, it's always uh, important to check with the uh, in, uh, your inspector ahead of time to let you know whether or not you need to be looking for that. You guys probably all know the market drivers. Why do people want energy storage? Well, home is a haven, right? More people are working from home. Uh, really, they're looking for the independence. A lot of that was driven from the um, uh, the the pandemic. Uh, existing infrastructure really hasn't been kept up the way it should be. Um, one thing, you know, and, and this kind of blew my mind, is that somebody with a, a rifle can shoot a substation and then knock out power to half a state. Uh, I think this happened in uh, either North Carolina or South Carolina, and, and that's really scary, um, not let alone um, uh, ice events, planned power shutoffs by uh, utilities here in California worried about wildfires, uh, hurricanes. We know the drill. Uh, we know that uh, climate-related disasters are also affecting thing, uh, affecting us. I think electrification of everything is really going to uh, push us. You know, there's a lot of there's been a lot of talk recently about EVs and the the laws around EVs. Um, also, thinking about natural gas prices. I don't know if anybody wants to put in what their uh, La their, their most expensive natural gas bill uh, was recently, but I, I, it's been going up. And one thing people are going to use to mitigate those high natural gas uh, bills is heat pumps. Let's move heat from one place to the other. What is also going to drive this is uh, water heaters, perhaps going to an electric water heater. Um, also getting, um, the, uh, getting your car off of uh, gas. So electrification of everything is going to put a big demand on the grid, and we're going to have to use distributed assets, energy storage, to really help us uh, into that next generation of what the power grid might look like. I was really excited about the uh, tax, the ITC. Uh, now we're, we're, we're good. We have 10 years now to get out there and, and sell these solar, sell these storage systems. You can now leverage um, a... 30% tax credit on just the energy storage alone. There might be instances and in homeowners that don't want solar. Maybe they just want a battery and we can use a generator to then charge that battery bank up when it needs to be charged. Well, you can leverage the 30% tax credit on just the energy storage. It doesn't have to be part of a larger uh, solar system. One thing I was really excited about the new ITC uh, was that it allows also nonprofits to take a, a, a cash payout rather than a tax credit. So I'm thinking about um, houses of worship that don't pay taxes that are looking to become a uh, become more resilient, become a sanctuary for their communities and have energy storage. Well, now they can leverage that 30% tax credit via a, a cash payout. So a lot of applications, um, upgrading an existing solar home, go out there to a, to your average Enphase microinverter system. Maybe they don't want the Enphase uh, battery. Maybe you don't want to install an Enphase battery. A lot of people you know, are going to look for that, that avenue. But if there's always opportunities to upgrade solar homes, you could go ahead and AC couple in uh, uh, energy storage. Time of use arbitrage has been um, always something that's happened in California. So back to the grid, of course. Here in California, we have these things called solar ready new homes. Maybe put into the Q and A if you have solar ready new homes in your uh, state. What is that? Well, usually it's a home with no gas lines, 
probably a upgraded bus bar, probably a 200 amp service with a 225 bus. That's going to allow you to backfeed a lot, uh, a lot more solar onto that bus without melting it. Uh, it's probably going to maybe have conduit already run up to the attic um, or crawl space um, up there to allow an easier install. The permitting has probably been streamlined in that community. So uh, EVs, EV chargers have maybe already been installed, but it's it's something we want to be prepared for if it's not something in your area already. Of course, backup power off grid, peak demand. Um, that's something that's more commercial side. So I see that with the peak shaving and time of use. One thing that's really been happening in California, and I don't know if anybody's been paying attention to this, is that we're having a new net metering. We had a very favorable NEM 2.0 is what they called it, net metering, where if you're a homeowner in California and you're during the day, you're producing electricity, you send it back to the grid, right? Because you're at work. You get a credit, a one-for-one -one credit for everything you send back to the grid. At night, in the winter, you can use up those credits. So at the end of the year, during your true-up period, you don't owe them anything and, and they don't owe you anything. But what's happening, they're, they're uh, making the new net metering agreement, NEM 3.0, more favorable to the, um, to the, the power um, companies, the, the utilities. And one reason they're doing that is because we have um, an overproduction of solar during the day. So what does that mean now? That during the day, when you export to the grid, you get a fraction of a credit for everything you export. And, and when you consume power, you're still paying at that full credit rate. So what this is really going to drive is people to adopt batteries so that they're going to store that electricity, that energy during the day generated from their solar. And then at night, they'll discharge those batteries to help uh, cover those expensive uh, times of energy. We're not going to discharge the battery all the way, right? I want to hold a little bit in reserve in case we have a, a power outage at night. So again, understanding some of these market drivers, uh, uh, net metering, I think, is, you know, as the way California goes, a lot of the country goes. So I think these net metering agreements are going to become less and less favorable as time goes by, which is really going to drive the adoption of energy storage. Talked about it a little bit already, but lithium iron phosphate is the chemistry we use. And a lot of our phones, right, you think about my phone or you think about my laptop, those are all cobalt-based uh, batteries. And they cobalt-based chem, uh, chemistries do have a time and a place, right? If you're thinking about energy density, uh, lightweight, a cobalt makes sense in a car and a laptop, something we're going to carry around. But when we're talking about home storage or, or business, it's a stationary product. So we're not really concerned about density or weight. What we're really concerned about is safety. So the safest of the chemistries is lithium iron phosphate. Uh, there's no danger of that thermal runaway, uh, not that toxic element. It, one thing I've always kind of noticed in the news, too, is about um, the mining of cobalt. Uh, there's, it's usually done by hand or machineries in, in disadvantaged countries around our world. So we're, we're kind of uh, creating this um, abusive mining practices industry while well, using lithium iron phosphate uh, when you mine lithium, uh, it's usually done by injecting water into a, a deep well, and then up comes the salt, which they evaporate out. So it's less uh, labor intensive. Uh, no safety monitoring, uh, and we're able to uh, work in some more extreme temperatures, which we'll talk about. So chemistry matters, but also form factor matters. If you look in uh, our batteries, if you were to open one of our batteries up, you'd see a bunch of cylindrical cells. They look like double A or triple A cells, and they're all packed in there in little packs and series and parallel configurations. And that matters, right? The way we construct the battery and what form factor we use matters. Pouch cells, which is probably the cheapest of all of the form factors, is really just wrapping the, the cells in a kind of an aluminum foil. Prismatic cells are, are decent. Uh, prismatic cells, there's nothing much wrong with them. What we do tend to see, though, is that each of the individual cells in the prismatic um, battery modules tend to have a larger cell volume. So when there is a, uh, a thermal runaway event, you see much more gas being vented. Cylindrical 
form factor is probably is the most expensive and most advanced of the manufacturing techniques because we have to spool up this cell. So when you're looking at uh, your battery offerings, pay attention to the chemistry, but also ask what kind of form factor are they using? Is it a pouch cell? Is it a cylindrical cell? A cylindrical, just to re recap, uh, is the safest because of that metal case kind of contains events. It also allows some of the better performance. It doesn't swell and contract as well during charge cycles. So let's talk a little bit about what thermal went away. It's when a cell uh, becomes uh, hot enough that a chemical reaction begins and it becomes kind of self-sustaining, generating more heat that can further accelerate the reaction to adjacent cells. So one thing to note is that you can have thermal runaway without any flames. It's simply the heat that can be uh, generated to adjacent cells can cause those cells to go into a thermal runaway. So by you know, using a fire extinguisher or putting some water on it, it it's going to not really put out any flames because there are no flames. What you need is a lot of water to cool the batteries down. And if we think about not just our batteries, but any other batteries on the market, they're usually pretty hard to get at, right? They're usually in a cabinet inside of another cabinet inside of these little cells. So thinking about how um, these at, at the beginning and think about how safety matters, I think is a great topic to talk with your homeowners. Usually these uh, thermal runaway events are caused by short circuiting, um, like due to a puncture or overcharging. One thing you notice is that uh, in the news, if you hear about the, the battery scooter fires in uh, New York, or you hear about somebody's lithium ion phone catching fire in an overhead bin in a plane, they're not talking about, uh, they're not calling out the different chemistries or the form factors. All you hear in the news is lithium ion battery fire. Uh, so last thing I kind of want to harp on this is you know, it's one thing to have a small battery in my phone here. It's another thing to have this large energy storage system in a home. As you scale up the energy storage capacity, you're scaling up that risk. Uh, this slide is talking a little bit about it, the temperature at which uh, lithium uh, iron phosphate versus uh, cobalt-based chemistries burn hotter. Uh, I don't know if anybody have, has watched Will Prowse. He, he's got a, a YouTube channel called DIY Solar Pro uh, uh, Power. It's He did this kind of cool video where he did a puncture test of a pouch cell LFP and a pouch cell cobalt. And you can kind of see what happened, right? He drilled a bunch of holes and he had to drill a whole bunch in that LFP to get it to go. Uh, in that NMC, he, he drilled one and it went, uh, you can see just for yourself what it looks like. I noticed on the left, he's actually placed that cobalt-based uh, pouch cell on top of another battery there. Um, but again, this is just that visual to, to, to look at that. If somebody wants to put in the chat, uh, say yes or no. Do you talk to your homeowners about um, uh, chemistry? Do you talk to your homeowners about safety uh, when you're trying to make that sale and, and talk about the advantages of what batteries you're using. I hope some of you um, are up in the northern areas. What I've seen is the adoption of energy storage systems in a lot of northern states in Canada in places where it gets cold. And as inspectors are kind of trying to, to clamp down on us, they might be forcing us to put some of these battery energy storage systems outside. Uh, and when you put things outside, cold weather quickly becomes a problem for lithium ion batteries of any chemistry from any manufacturer. You can't charge a lithium ion battery below freezing without having some sort of mitigating uh, device like a, a battery heater or battery warmer or an enclosure that's heated. So here's some of the, the charts here. You can uh, notably uh, charge battery um, a little bit. Um, you know, you can you can discharge a battery in kind of a wider range than you can charge a battery. And what I'm showing you here is on the top uh, part of this uh, slide is our Phi battery and the smaller um, 1.45 battery that do not have closed loop communications. They're not able to talk to a piece of equipment. So when you have um, a piece of equipment that's not able to communicate with the battery, we want to be very careful to not charge or discharge the batteries outside of the ranges you see there. 
But if we have a communicating battery, like that Amplify, like that Simplify battery that you see down at the bottom, those can actually have, they actually have built in 10K thermistors. So they know their own internal cell temperature, which is going to be different than an ambient temperature. And they can then tell a piece of equipment like a charge controller or like an inverter charger to uh, ramp down my charge or discharge rate so you don't damage the battery. And at some point you can, and when it gets a little bit warm enough, you can start to kind of trickle charge that battery. And due to the internal resistance of that battery, that battery can kind of generate its own heat and kind of warm itself up. We also have uh, hour long trains where all we talk about, not all we talk about, but what we talk about a lot for the whole hour is cold weather, uh, extreme environment uh, mitigation strategies. We also talk about uh, altitude um, and uh, sea, sea salt spray. Um, so again, uh, check out our training calendar on our website for one of those uh, environmental consideration talks if this is something you're interested in. We have a 10-year warranty. We like to keep it simple, simplify power. A 10-year warranty, unlimited cycles at 100% depth of discharge. You'll see other manufacturers might say a certain number of cycles at a certain depth of discharge or maybe a certain amount of uh, power power throughput in megawatt hours. So we don't uh, keep it uh, keep it constrained. We want to let you discharge it all the way down, unlimited cycles for 10 years. And if you look carefully in our warranty, uh, we warranty that at the end of that 10 years, the battery will still have an 80% retained energy capacity. That being said, if you're cycling these daily, if you're going to be kind of hammering on them, I'd rather see you size for an 80% depth of discharge. That's really going to give the most life of the battery after the warranty period. But if it's just sitting there in a standby application, uh, maybe just doing peak shaving here and there, go ahead and size for 100% DOD. Mentioned a little bit earlier about battery management systems. We really have three types. One is a non-communicating battery management system, like you see here in this photo. There's no comms ports. There's no Cat 5E ports on this battery. We have a third, a second type of battery management system, which is able to communicate and transmit its state of charge, uh, pre-program set points into pieces of equipment. Um, that's found in our Amplify and, simplif um, and Simplify battery. The third type of battery management system is called the stack controller, which we found on our high voltage lines. Really, the battery management system there is for cell balancing. It's going to keep uh, the internal cells balanced, but it's also there kind of as the lifeguard of the battery. It's going to prevent uh, you from overcharging or over discharging the battery. Um, it's going to prevent you from uh, draining it too much or filling it too much. It has a, a contactor or a FET in there that's going to open up when it sees something that it doesn't like. It's important to note that uh, that battery management system protections isn't an excuse for a poorly programmed or a poorly sized system. One key feature of our batteries is the C rate or the ability for a battery to be charged or discharged. So a C rate, if you don't know, is the measure or rate at which the battery can be discharged or charged relative to its maximum capacity. So for example, we have a 3.8 kilowatt hour battery. The max charge or discharge rate would be 1.9 kilowatts. If you're somebody who thinks in amp hours, like our old school, uh, say we have a, a 48 volt, 3.8 uh, kilowatt hour battery, well, that's 75 kilowatt hours. So if we were to divide a C over two rate, right, divide it by two, that'd be 37.5 amps at 48 volts that you could charge or discharge a battery. Why does this matter? Well, what if we need to, you got a small solar window and you want to charge that battery up quickly, get it full, and then kind of let you go the rest of the day? What if we're charging the batteries via a generator? We can go ahead and run that generator at full tilt, charge those batteries up, and then shut the generator down, saving runtime. Uh, usually generators are warranted on runtime and save fuel. And, the, and the, that rate, uh, the 1.9 kilowatts or the 37.5 amps scales up, right? It doubles every time you add a battery to the system. One thing I've always loved to, to mention is that we have the ability to scale up our batteries. Uh, you can really scale up as large as you want uh, with the Phi batteries. Uh, the Amplify batteries, due to communication uh, limitations, the comms cables, 
we can only go up to about 72 uh, batteries, but that's still a, a large system. And you're scaling up, like I mentioned, in power, but also in energy storage. Expandability is a great one. A lot of times <clears throat> homeowners want to have energy storage, but they can't afford, say, the largest system they want. Well, that's fine. Let's get you a starter system. We'll pull some loads out of the main panel, we'll put them in a critical loads panel, and just know, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, we can always come back and add batteries after uh, the fact. Keep in mind, usually you don't want to go more than two or three years down the road before you add batteries. Uh, one, because batteries, as I said before, kind of lose capacity over time, and the new batteries are going to act like the old batteries. Also, the warranty of the new batteries is going to revert to the warranty period of the uh, old battery. So you got 10 year warranty, batteries have been in place for eight years. You go ahead and add some new batteries. Those new batteries in effect are gonna have an eight year warranty. This is what it can look like, easy to scale. I love that picture on the left there. That's a, a airport hangar in Hawaii. I really like those custom copper bus bars that you see there that are, are running all those batteries in parallel. Remember never, uh, run our batteries in series, um, only in parallel. Um, but actually, I'm going to take that back. Our high voltage lines can be run in series. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. Picture on the right there shows what it looked like. Somebody had eight batteries on that. Looks like in Sunny Island there. Uh, we came back and added eight more, able to double the energy capacity um, and also double the, the power, the ability. But um, looking at that inverter, really the inverter is not going to be able to draw any more power in watts than it was before we added those batteries. So what we were doing is doubling the, the energy. These aren't like lead acid batteries, right? You don't got to water the battery. Uh, you don't have to, to have the, the hydrogen vents going. And unlike lead acid batteries, they don't self-discharge very rapidly. Usually they lose about 1% per month. So what I'm thinking about for this application is your winter cabins where you uh, leave for half the year, you come back. Well, you're going to know that the batteries still have a good charge on them. Uh, of course, you know, get a good charge, full charge cycle on them before you start drawing loads. But they're going to be there ready for, for you when you get back. This is what it can look like for a, a lead acid battery replacement. On the left there, what do we see on the left? A bunch of... Uh, Trojan, not T, L, L, they're not T105s, they look like L16s, um, six volts. Uh, but what a mess, you know, you got all these uh, temperature sensors, a bunch of battery cables going everywhere, uh, the anti corrosion paste. Uh, what you see on the right actually has just as much energy storage in amp hours or kilowatt hours as the picture on the left, but it also has just as much uh, power. Uh, capacity, the ability to, to push power as that picture on the left. So it's really exciting to see what it can look like uh, for a lead acid battery replacement. Talked about this one. This is our Phi 3.8, either 24 or 48 volts. It does not have that uh, advanced battery communication capable uh, battery management system, but it does still have the protections built in and an internal circuit breaker. It's not that this battery is any less um, valuable or important than a battery that does have that more advanced battery uh, management system that can communicate. Think about if you have an old uh, a Xantrex, say you have an old Trace, say you have an old Outback system that can't leverage uh, closed loop communication capabilities, then don't go buy a battery that has it. Just go ahead and save your homeowner a little money and buy a battery that's still going to work great, that doesn't um, have that communication capabilities. Again, just make sure you get in and adjust the set points in that old outback so you're not charging uh, the battery too high a voltage or overdrawing the current. Here's the Amplify, the one that does have that closed loop communication capabilities. This one does have a little bit of a higher max discharge as well, um, and really, the best part about this closed loop communication capabilities is that it auto populates set points and inverters. Uh, it can give a very accurate state of charge reading to the inverter. So, you know, it's not like the old uh, off grid days where the homeowner's walking out to the power shack and looking at the voltage of the batteries, right? Homeowners want a, an app and they want a fuel gauge on their app to know exactly where their batteries are at. And having this closed loop communications helps uh, give them that accurate fuel gauge. 
Here's a 1.4. Uh, we don't sell a lot of these. It's a 12 volt version, but I like to see these in mobile applications. I was always surprised to see uh, these Sprinter vans, these uh, Dodge um, or, or the Ford Transit vans. People are no longer going out and buying an RV. They're buying these uh, Sprinters and these, these um, um, Ford vans and outfitting them for these uh, overland expeditions. Or So a lot of them uh, usually leveraging Victron pieces of equipment, I've noticed, uh, need batteries. And our batteries will work perfectly for um, that Victron equipment or other pieces of equipment. Um, and it's, they're kind of a smaller, lighter uh, weight kind of battery that allows it to fit great for mobile applications. We do make a couple of packaged units. One of the first one I'm going to talk about is our express unit. One thing I've noticed is a lot of people in this country want resiliency. They want backup power, but a lot of people in our country don't own their home. They live in apartments. Uh, they may be renting a home and they're not able to go up to the roof and, and install a solar or put a permanently uh, mounted uh, battery bank in the garage or outside. So what about them? Well, they can leverage these kind of portable systems. And what you're seeing here is our express system. It's got a, that magna sign in there. It's got two of our batteries and it's got a charge controller in there. So it's got a DC inlet. So you can feed DC from your solar modules directly into that charge controller, keep those batteries charged. But it also has an AC input that's going to use that magna sign to keep those batteries charged. And of course, it has a AC outlet to, to run your critical loads. But this is perfect for a, an apartment. Go ahead and plug it into the wall, keeps it charged, keeps it on a float charge and, and keeps them uh, topped off. So if there is an event, you go ahead and have resilience. I kind of like them for jobs. If say we're doing a service change on somebody's home and we're gonna cut power to the home, utility company comes out in the morning, cuts power, we're doing a service upgrade. Uh, we can roll this out to the job site, uh, give the homeowners maybe who are inside trying to eat lunch, uh, watch TV, uh, make a little lunch. And the, the guys doing the service change can also charge their tools with this as well. Uh, so this is the express system. What it is a more permanently mounted system is our um, access unit. And what you're seeing here is this NEMA 3R rated enclosure. So you can go ahead and put it outside right next to that existing grid tie inverter and AC couple it up. Uh, you're seeing a Solark in that picture, but we could also put a Schneider um, XW Pro in there. We can even put our new inverter in that as well, which I'm going to show you a picture of here. The inverter up top and then up to six batteries on the bottom. We also sell a version of this that has either uh, four batteries down below. So with that Solark, with our new inverter, you can also DC couple as well. This is the, the boss cabinet. So essentially, we took that same cabinet. We took out the inverter and we added six more batteries. Uh, and then also the Boss 6 cabinet, which you see down there on the left, is the, just kind of the half size cabinet. I think these are great. You know, it's, it's really easy to add uh, battery heating um, pads in these things. Uh, there's a nice terminal block in this, so we can run it out to a piece of equipment, the inverter, uh, the charge controller. It's outdoor rated, but I've seen these done indoor just to keep it nice looking in a, um, uh, a garage. One of the really exciting parts about Briggs & Stratton is us uh, launching our new vertically integrated energy storage system. A lot of people are going this direction. When you, when you go to these new these solar shows, the RE pluses, uh, the intersolars, you see everyone's coming out with vertically integrated. Why? Because it's one tech support call, one warranty, one installation manual, and you know that all of these pieces of equipment have been vetted to communicate with each other and work with each other very, uh, very um, closely or, or, or very well vetted. 6K inverter. The 6K inverter has three ports, a bi-directional grid port, a load out port, and a gen in port. The gen in port can be used to either AC couple in some solar or we can go ahead and, and add a generator into this system. The 4.98 kilowatt hour battery that you see there in the middle is an outdoor rated battery uh, that has the same uh, chemistry, lithium iron phosphate, the same form factor, cylindrical, and the same battery management system as that amplified battery. So that communicating battery uh, management system. On the far right is the app. 
And, and that's kind of the third leg of the stool. I, I said it earlier. I think a lot of homeowners, they're not going out to the power shack. They're not going to, to look at the piece of equipment. A lot of pieces of equipment don't even have a display on them anymore. Uh, so what are they doing? They're having to interface with the system through their phone. And having a phone app that works well, uh, displays the information it clearly uh, for the homeowner is important. I also would argue that it's important for the uh, installer because the installer is allowed to do uh, fleet management, remote reconfiguration, and the homeowner knows that that installer is keeping an eye on their system. Again, uh, we'll go over the kind of the quick um, summary of the inverter. Uh, it has that load out, so it has a built-in uh, microgrid interconnection device, or it allow has a, a built-in transfer switch. So we can go ahead and switch over at less than eight milliseconds. So you're not even going to have to reset your clocks. It actually does have a screen. So although there is that app that allows you to commission it and program it, you don't need it. Uh, I always encourage people to have uh, the, the app and the gateway so we can do over-the-air firmware updates and reconfigurations. But you could get into that screen and uh, adjust things. Batteries. Still warranty, 10-year uh, unlimited cycles, 100% depth of discharge. Notably, this battery is outdoor rated if you purchase the conduit box that sits on top. That Phi and Amplify 3.8s would have to either go indoors or go into a battery cabinet. Here's the app. Uh, quick uh, uh, quick uh, commissioning, uh, over-the-air updates, and really doing fleet management is, is important for installers. So uh, I talked about it earlier. We were at um, NAPSEP, we were at um, InterSolar, we were at uh, RE Plus, and I was blown away by the number of you people that are coming by the booth asking for high voltage and, and asking about the solutions. Um, so I'm not the expert in it, but I'm gonna uh, do my best. And if it's something that's interesting, uh, interested, uh, interests you, Email me. I will connect you up with our high voltage team. Uh, it's the projects teams, and they have a whole team of people uh, working on this that will gladly talk with you um, about more details. There are containerized solutions, but there's also rack-mounted solutions. So these rack-mounted solutions would be for a kind of a, I'm thinking a high-end home. I'm thinking of small commercial. Uh, these uh, high voltage solutions, it's that still um, that proven battery uh, with the lithium iron phosphate, um, the cylindrical cell form factor um, that are able to really stand up to a long, long life. One thing that I've kind of learned about commercial systems is that really, you know, they're, each project is a little different. So when you come to our projects team, they're going to want to know, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to do backup? Are you trying to do demand response? Are you trying to do peak shaving? And that's really going to drive the conversation and the way that we uh, put together a system for you on, on what, what you're trying to accomplish. So be ready to answer some questions uh, from that high voltage team to help uh, best address your needs. What you notice here, I talked about it before, is all of our batteries historically have been uh, in parallel, whereas high voltage solutions are in series. So each one of these uh, is these little batteries you see here is uh, kind of the stack is 4.3 kilowatt hours, and they're in series, if you notice. So there's a 24 volt version or a 48 volt version, and, and they stack up. And what you notice on top is that uh, battery management system, the stack controller. That's the third type of battery management system that we offer, uh, and that's controlling that whole stack. When you, when you talk to us, um, we can do that, that rack mounted solution, but we can also do a containerized solution. You basically, and I've heard it said this way, you pour us a concrete pad and we'll drop a container there uh, ready to go and help you get it commissioned. Um, these containerized solutions have uh, all the fire suppression systems and heating and ventilation systems that may be required for your specific uh, project. If you have an inverter you want, great. We can most likely work with that inverter. If you're not sure what inverter you need, uh, we have inverters um, that we've worked with in the past uh, and make sure we can get it to work. One thing really, it, I think in anything in life, if you look at what something costs, uh, the upfront price versus what is the lifetime 
uh, cost of the, the system. So a lot of people look at the price of an energy storage system from one battery to the next and might see a higher upfront price. What they're not looking up looking at is the uh, lifetime cost of the battery. So one thing I like to do when I'm sitting down at the kitchen table uh, is, and I'm, I'm an energy storage consultant, right? I'm not a salesperson. I like to use math. And, and math kind of removes you from that salesperson role and really kind of shows the person uh, what the, the value proposition is. So if you were to say, take a price of a battery and look at the capacity of the battery, by the multiplied by the number of warranted cycles, by the round trip efficiency, by the planned depth of discharge, that gives you a number of how many, how much does it cost for every kilowatt hour I put into a battery and take out of the battery over its lifetime. And when you do that, you start to see that it's it's a lot lower than what it might be compared to other uh, lead acid batteries that only last four or five years. Uh, compared to other battery chemistries, especially when you start factoring in uh, warranty claims, um, the risk that's associated with more dangerous chemistries, with uh, maintenance that may need be required, uh, with larger kind of setbacks and clearances that were called out for more dangerous chemistries. So really, you can start to look at the math. Um, and you don't have to remember this uh, equation at all. Why? Because there's a, a link to the calculator, which is found on our website. We're going to talk about uh, sizing. This is something that comes up a lot, especially with new uh, installers that are looking to get into the market. And they're, they're not sure how to talk about sizing. What I like to do with the homeowner is really set the expectation that we're doing a, a critical loads backup panel. Uh, there might be homeowners that, that want the more kind of advanced uh, systems where whole home backup, and you can have those conversations. One thing I want to talk about with sizing is that there's two things to consider. How much energy capacity, right? How big is the fuel tank or how big is the water tank? And then how much can we discharge the batteries at a given rate? That's where that C rate came in again. So if you're sizing for capacity, I mentioned this before, I really like to see a size for an 80% depth of discharge. Uh, that might mean you have to add an, a battery or two to the size, uh, to the battery bank so that they're not always draining the battery. But if you have a standby application, go ahead and size it for 100% DOD. Uh, if you do size it for an 80% depth of discharge, a 20% state of charge, you're going to get a lot more cycles out of that battery over its life. There may be situations, uh, again, where you can go for that uh, larger depth of discharge like standby. The second thing, again, that was energy storage. Now we're going to talk about power requirements. So this is the example I always like to use. You see that Outback Radian sitting right there? And I got those Outback charge controllers in that picture. That Outback Radian is an 8,000 watt inverter. So if ever that inverter is called upon to deliver 8,000 watts to the loads, theoretically, it'll be drawing 8,000 watts out of the batteries. In fact, it's probably going to draw a little bit more due to inverter inefficiencies. I don't want to see the batteries exceed their maximum charge, or in this case, discharge rating of 1.9 kilowatts. So I would need really five of these batteries so that at any moment, that inverter is never going to discharge those batteries faster than what they're warrantied for. The charge controllers, I'm not so worried about. A lot of charge controllers, you can program the charge amps, and, and that charge controller is really going to listen to that programming. But the inverter is not a lot of inverters are able to be programmed to limit their output. Uh, Solark is a notable exception. Uh, so if we have communicating batteries, I'll kind of let you get around this rule. You don't got to remember a lot of that because um, we have calculators on our website. Utilize the tools on our website. That first top one that you see there, battery bank sizing, that's pretty cool. Put in how many kilowatt hours that homeowner is using. It's going to spit out uh, how many batteries you need in kilowatt hours to get them through. Uh, you can also enter in days of autonomy there. Maybe they're not sure how much uh, how much power they're using for those backup. That's that second calculator there. That's going to say, okay, I want a fridge. I want my lights. I want my internet and I want my router and I want a TV to be powered. And this is how many hours a day I'm going to use them during an outage. And that will tell you how many kilowatt hours 
uh, or maybe watt hours that a homeowner is going to need. So that, that'll allow you to design a system that are going to get your homeowners through uh, the, the outages. It also can be used um, to then also size time of use arbitrage um, or also the, the you know, save solar storage during the day and discharge at night. The last two calculators uh, get a little more specific. Um, they start to ask you about in, uh, individual pieces of equipment and start to take into account the max charge and discharge rates of batteries. If you're going to do one thing, you know, not everybody reads the manual, but I mentioned it earlier. We have these things called integration guides. So if you have one of our batteries and you're looking to install it at a, a system, an existing system that has a MagnaSign, that has the Victron, that has the Trace, maybe it's a, a Schneider. Uh, these integration guides tell you how to program that piece of equipment in the order in which that piece of equipment is asking for those set points. So it's a great thing. Integration guides, uh, print them out, uh, bring them to the job site in case you don't have any internet out there. Uh, and that way you know you're going to program that system to treat our batteries the way they want to be treated. Of course, we have spec sheets and manuals available. When it comes to mounting, um, really there's no clearance. You can't put these batteries right up against each other. You saw those in that uh, the boss cabinets. One thing you don't have to have those boss cabinets is because we have um, wall brackets. And these wall brackets, um, you can see in the picture here. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. But if you notice, all of these batteries are in parallel. But not only that, but they have conductors of the same gauge and the same length going to these combiner panels. They're not daisy chained in parallel. What that means is that they're, each battery is going to work just as hard as the next. You're not going to have some batteries working harder due to uh, resistance in the, the battery cables. Lastly on this slide is don't mount the batteries upside down. You can have them on their side, on their face, just not upside down. So this is, I kind of want to illustrate this again. You have to run the batteries in parallel. That don't go get 224 volt fives and, and run them in series to get 48 volts. Go out and buy 48 volt batteries. But conductors of the same gauge, same length, all running to a common terminal block, bus bar, or of the like. You don't have to use um, our bus bars. Um, Midnight Solar makes a great example. And uh, at NAPSEP conference, I was excited to, excuse me, see a, a 500 volt version of this um, combiner here. They still don't have an outdoor rated version, but Midnight Solar makes the, the great, uh, great uh, combiners. Uh, lots of other ones out there. Victron makes some. Uh, you can even do some of your own custom designs. When it comes time to torquing the battery lugs, please, please go out to your truck, the van, get your torque wrench. Hopefully it's an insulated torque wrench uh, and torque the batteries down to 160 inch pounds. Don't let one of your installers go get the Makita or Milwaukee impact driver and you know let them go down, go to town um, on one of the, the, the terminals. Sorry if you're a Bosch or DeWalt person. I, I'm a... Uh, tool agnostic, I'll see it like that. We're getting to the end. So if you got questions, now's a good time to put the questions into the Q&A for any of these topics. I got a couple just kind of showing you what this can look like. Uh, single line diagrams. What do we got there? We got a solar arc sitting there in the middle. We have a Tygo uh, transmitter sending the Keep Alive signal up to those TS4F, I think rapid shutdown modules that are on those solar. So we have DC coupled, right? We got DC coming down the roof, feeding into that solar charge controller. DC going right out of that charge controller into those batteries, uh, the two BOSS 12 cabinets. And we have it could be back feeding to grid through that non-backed up loads panel with that main and out to grid. Or if the grid goes down, we're going to cut grid and we're going to island ourselves and we're going to start back feeding, or not back feeding, but a feeding power to that critical loads uh, sub panel you see there. One thing I want to note, if, if you look carefully at those BOSS 12 cabinets, we actually do sell bus bars, uh, either the BB2s or the BB3 bus bars. So that kind of goes against what I just said, right? If you look carefully at those bus bars on those batteries in that BOSS 12, they're in parallel, but they're daisy chain, right? Daisy chain is positive, 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 negative, negative, negative. 
off. And the reason we allow that with bus bars, because bus bars have a tremendous amount of um, volume to them, right? It's like, it's like running eight odd or so. I'm not sure I'm not going to throw out it. But the, if you look at the cross section of those bus bars, it's thick enough so that you're not seeing any voltage drop across batteries. So in this case, using our bus bars, we do allow you to um, daisy chain them up. What does an AC coupled system look like? Here's a uh, Schneider. I just want to let you know and, and drive home the fact that our batteries are, are um, inverter agnostic, charge controller agnostic. Come out to somebody's house. They got some, what are those, IQ7? Look like IQ7 pluses there. This right here should probably be a, um, an IQ combiner box. I should change that photo. An IQ, IQ3 maybe. Um, we're back feeding AC into that Schneider. We have our critical load subpanel. We got grid with non-backed up loads. And we got two BOSS 12 cabinets. You don't have to have all those batteries. In fact, if you just had one BOSS cabinet, you wouldn't even need that combiner. You could just feed it right up into the, what from that one BOSS 12 up to the Schneider. And I believe that Schneider has a, a couple extra um, spots on our DC bus as well. So, but what can it look like with uh, our inverter? You could DC couple. Our inverter has built-in AP smart systems uh, transmitter. So in this example, I'm showing AP smart rapid shutdown uh modules on those dc uh solar oh, well all solar panels are dc but the dc coupled solar panels we got a backed up loads panel i don't know this i should probably change this we don't really need a main breaker up in that backed up loads uh then the main and then grid and we have three of our simplify 4.98 batteries What's noticeable about this, though, is that because we were able to DC couple this system, we were able to leave that gen port open. And that allows us to AC couple in a generator. Now, our inverter has a built-in two-wire start. So imagine it's imagine that solar is not even there uh, and, and you're not even doing a solar system. Well, as the batteries get drained, they're, they're down, 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 or maybe it's cloudy out, the inverter can send a two-wire signal to start. It's going to start that generator up. The generator is going to run as full tilt, charge those batteries up. And then I'm, I'm probably not going to get the batteries fully charged. I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to be floating the batteries on that generator, but I'll get a good bulk charge on them. And then we'll do a two wire signal to start to stop the generator and let that generator sit while we're using that stored energy. So there is examples here. And I think it's going to be more common as where generators and solar can complement each other. And I'm not just saying that because I work for Briggs & Stratton, one of the largest, longest manu uh, manufacturers of generators. Um, we're getting to the end. If any questions, now's your chance. Uh, in a couple slides, I'm going to show you that email to where to email for your NATSEP credits. If you're looking for future trainings, uh, go to uh, Power Academy. That's one great thing to be able to leverage from Briggs & Stratton is this online uh, learning uh, portal uh, called Power Academy. Anybody can join. Uh, go to the URL or text LEARN to 33988. For those of you installing our batteries, I want to throw out a, a promotion we have going through the end of the month. We're going to give you a $1,000 sign-up bonus. So get your phone out right now and, and hold it up to the screen. And uh, this UR, um, a QR code here is going to take you to uh, our um, uh, application page. If you uh, apply and install a battery system, you can get a $1,000 sign up battery bonus. Uh, regardless, we're still running a $25 cash back per battery. Uh, we'll put you on the maps. Um, you can see we're, it's kind of hard to tell here with this map, but there are a lot of um, uh, empty spots if you start to zoom in. And we would love that for you to be an installer. If, if a homeowner comes to our website and looking for an installer, uh, they go to our maps, they're going to find you. Uh, if our internal sales team gets a call from somebody asking for an installer, they use that this tool to find you. Uh, and we also have a photo contest as well. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're about to jump into Q&A. There's my email, training at simplifiedpower.com. Email me, say, Daniel, I would like my NAPSEP credits. Um, I, here's my name fully spelled out so I know exactly what name to put on your, um, on your certificate. With that, let's let's jump into um, some some questions. Oh, uh, yeah, somebody said they are they did go to NAPSEP. 
Well, that was great. Uh, great talks. Um, I love the NAPSEP conferences because, you know, there is kind of a, 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 a expo, but everybody leaves the expo and goes to these talks. And then they go to these talks and then come back during the lunches, during the, the break. So it was really an intimate kind of great show. Uh, when you go to the RE pluses and the inner solars, it's just kind of this big kind of sea of people. And they do have talks at those ones, but I, I loved it. Thanks for being there. Um, and uh, we'll go uh, we'll go next year. I think it's going to be in Raleigh. Somebody's asking about virtual power plant capability. Uh, that's something I think uh, the high voltage team is going to uh, be able to best address. Um, email me, and we'll go ahead and, and get back to you. Uh, somebody's asking about the battery management system. It, I said it has a low uh, temp sensor, but what about the high voltage, high temperature sensor? Absolutely. Uh, the battery management system is going to uh, uh, be able to open up the contactor if it gets too hot or too cold. I, I don't know the exact high high setting. It was back on one of my slides. I think it's up above 150, um, right around 150 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, but I could be wrong on that. Email me for the specifics. Uh, really, what we want to do is protect these batteries. And I said, you know, northern climates, I'm seeing a lot more these uh, battery installations going into these northern areas that historically haven't seen a lot of energy storage, but also in warmer climates as well. Um, and, and kind of build upon what that person's question was, uh, there are ventilation um, systems to keep those battery cabinets cool. And there, there are additional um, considerations that we talk about in uh, some upcoming trainings. So keep an eye out that. Um, that same person is asking about, can we get the um, battery management? Uh, does the battery management system record those temperatures and transmit it? By default, no. There are uh, some other new Sun Road, I think, makes a, a, a gateway that allows you to really get into the more gran granular detail of what the battery management systems are looking at, like individual cell voltages, uh, temperatures. Um, a lot of that's kind of hidden uh, in the background because, you know, the average homeowner doesn't really need to know a lot of that. Uh, maybe your average installer really doesn't need to know a lot of that, but it is possible to, I believe, to pull that out of there. Uh, somebody's asking about insurance on um, batteries. I, I think I'm not the expert on that. I think that's going to be a, a good question. Just like when people ask detailed questions about the uh, IRA and the ITC and tax implications, I'm not a tax professional. Ask your um, ask your tax professional. Um, I, I would argue the same thing is that I'm not an insurance adjuster. I'm not an insurance expert, but it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, when you know, now there's what a battery, uh, a few batteries here and there in our neighborhoods. What is it going to look like in 10 years from now and 20 years from now, after all of you and I have been busy installing batteries in our neighborhoods and there's a there's a fire, an event, uh, and it makes the news. Well, if that was that battery system permitted, uh, did it have the UL listings? Um, I think that's going to open up a lot of questions and, and um, we'll see we'll see what happens Um if you uh, happen to find out more, let me know. Um, somebody's asking about, you know, AC coupling uh, with end phase, um, and, and there are, one of the things, and, and this is a, a good good point. So when you AC couple something, uh, you have the end phase. You know, um, I forget the name of the app. It's on my end ch charge or something like that. Uh, you're going to have two apps, which is kind of frustrating, right? So you got, and this isn't just specific to simplify. Um, so if you have the Solarc app and it's AC coupled to the Enphase app, right? Should you be able to tell uh, how much uh, power is coming in from Enphase, the Enphase system? But are you going to be able to tell which microinverters are throwing uh, an error code um, from the Solarc app? No. So you're going to be stuck with these two apps. And that's another reason going back to why I see uh, one vertically integrated energy storage system with one app being important. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, DC generators. So uh, remember, the solar arc has an AC input. The, the uh, simplify inverter has an AC input. Uh, so it has to be AC coupled in there. 
Uh, do I see a DC uh, generator option coming down the road? I hope so. I think that would be really cool. I know there's a lot of challenges to that, but you cannot, uh, and, and I don't really know of that many DC generators out there. And, and keep in mind, it doesn't have to be a standby generator. Right? What's a standby generator is a, um, a pad mounted gaseous fuel, like propane or natural gas generator. You could theoretically just have the good old wheel it out of your garage gasoline generator. As long as, uh, as, long as it's a 240 volt uh, generator, you could put a twist lock 30 amp inlet into that solar, into the uh, simplify inverter and, and use that and back feed that way. Um, so um, yeah, I don't see the, the DC. That's an interesting kind of thing. And I've seen some, some other manufacturers kind of dabbling in that. We'll see how that goes. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Um, uh, somebody's asking about um, NAPSEP scholarships. Uh, that is a great question. I'm not sure about that. I, I'm, sh I'm almost positive that they do. Uh, so if people aren't familiar what NAPSEP is, it's North American Certified Board of Energy Practitioners. And they offer a certificate. You can get a, a, a board certified certificate that shows you uh, as an installer to your homeowners that you're somebody that's just not uh, Joe Schmo in their truck, that you have the training that shows that you know what you're doing. Uh, they actually have this, uh, it's called an associate's um, NABCEP certificate, which I, I got. And it's, they've called it entry level. It's, it's much easier uh, barrier to, to get in. But just because you have your NAPSEP certificate doesn't mean you need to keep it. You have to do the continuing education, which is why some of you are here, here getting these, these um, certificates. Um, so I would email NAPSEP. Let me know what you find. Um, uh, somebody's asking about uh, communications, Bluetooth communications. Um, you can match the... So right now, um, the Bluetooth is used to commission the battery. And then for the Wi-Fi would be what's allowing you to access the app. Um, again, there are, you're kind of indicating about cold weather. Um, we're not transmitting that temperature. Take a look at our upcoming trainings uh, because we're gonna have a lot more talks about cold weather as we kind of come along. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, please uh, email me and look for us next time. Thanks again.